Hello, welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is the 2nd of July 2014. Welcome to all listeners, new ones, old ones. Thanks for your support as ever. Really appreciate it. I'm currently in Ukraine, leaving tomorrow back for London, UK. Today's news, Ukraine. Quiet and calm here in Odessa, although fighting is still going on in the east. People dying over there, people sunbathing on the beach over here in Odessa, uh, which is often the way. I mean, I've been in other places where there's revolutions and wars going on, and uh, in other parts, even of the same city, you wouldn't know anything's going on. Um, hopefully things will stay away from Odessa anyway, um, although our thoughts are with people in the east as well. Okay, the funerals of three teenagers who were abducted and murdered while hitchhiking in the occupied West Bank have been held in Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu described their killers as heinous murderers, and Israel's blamed um, Hamas for the deaths, although Hamas has denied any involvement. Uh, their bodies were found on Monday. Now this is this is very bad. Um, I've got the uh, deepest of sympathies for the families of these people and understand if Israel is, Israel and Israelis are upset about this but it doesn't mean that Israel can go and just kill um, lots of Palestinians now as revenge which does so often seem to be the way it's just as bad as and doesn't solve anything I mean there's there's too much hatred on both sides I've seen um, documentaries where they've sh they've been inside schools in Palestine and in uh, Israel and they're all, all the teachers are teaching hatred until that stops then things are not going to change people need to start changing their opinions easy for me to say I know but just thought I'd say that tens of thousands of protesters have taken part in what organizers say could be Hong Kong's largest pro-democracy rally in a decade I think there's about half a million people there uh, although police said about a hundred thousand people took part the annual rally uh, marks the day Hong Kong was returned to China, which happened in 1997. The French uh, veil ban was upheld by the European Court. The European Court of Human Rights has upheld a ban by France on wearing the Muslim full-face veil, the niqab. A case was brought by a 24-year-old French woman who argued that the ban on wearing the veil in public violated her freedom of religion and expression. French law says nobody can wear in a public space clothing intended to conceal the face and there's fines for that. Uh, that law came uh, in under former Conservative President Nicolas Sarkozy who's now under investigation himself. I, I believe he was arrested. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that because I don't know enough about it at the moment but I remember seeing uh, fairly recently that that had happened. Now regarding the, um, the ban I mean, personally, I feel there's two factors here, or maybe more than two factors. Uh, religious freedoms, freedoms in general, uh, whether people who go to another country have to adapt to that country. It's, um, it's a difficult situation. I, I think people should be allowed to wear what they want to wear, but if asked to remove it in situations where it's a hindrance, they should do so. For example, in England, um, some refuse to uh, remove their veil, even though it's a requirement by law uh, in England to show your face at court. I mean, anyone could just put a veil over their face and and take the place of someone else. So, I mean, you've got to have common sense about these things. Let me know what you think about that anyway. I do think that people, when they go to another country, should abide by the laws there. Um, the Crown Prosecution Service says it will work with the police to see if there's enough evidence to bring further charges against Rolf Harris. Now, for those people who don't know Rolf Harris, he was a uh, originally came from Australia but lived in England and was an inventor, a musician, an artist, very popular guy. He he used to be on a program about animals and anyway, it turns out, or at least he's been prosecuted for being a child abuser, as as have a lot of um, entertainers. It seems from from our childhood, like uh, Jimmy Savile. Uh, Rolf Harris, some other media people, uh, some DJs and uh, other celebrities on TV all seem to be under the microscope at the moment.
but police have uh, received new complaints against uh, Rolf Harris, who's who's actually being prosecuted now. Um, he was convicted of 12 indecent assaults on four girls in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Some of them were quite, quite young, seven or eight years old was the younger one, youngest one. Now Rolf Harris, it turns out, was um, also a friend of Jimmy Savile, who was best friend, friends of uh, Prince Charles. Uh, Rolf Harris was also artist for the Queen. Always does seem that whenever these cases come up, there's some royal connection. Hmm. Wonder if that should be investigated. Of course, it won't be at all. I mean, Prince Charles also gave uh, refuge to a paedophile on his release from prison. I'm sure he was just uh, helping out. Yeah, there's nothing to worry about there. The the press don't talk about that at all, um, as as they also don't read much into the fact that Diana gave the royal phone book to the press. Could that be motivation for murder? Uh, for her death. I mean, she did say before she died, they're going to kill me in a car crash. No, that's uh, that's fine. We'll just ignore that. Um, I'm sure there's nothing in that at all. ISIS militants said they now want to be known as the Islamic State. The leader of jihadist militant group ISIS has called on Muslims to travel to Iraq and Syria to help build an Islamic State. He said that in an audio message. He made a special call for judges, doctors, engineers and people with military and administrative expertise. This apparently could spark a war to outdo atrocities between Al-Qaeda and ISIS. I mean, wh what have these people got to do with religion really? They're just killers. Uh, but I, I still say the silence of the Muslim community is deafening. I mean, I still want to invite some Muslims to come on this show and have a frank discussion about all of this and tell me what they think and that includes any militants as well please get in touch I'm gonna skip this week's news a little bit I mean uh, that's the main news of the day um, because I want to get on to part two of Douglas Dietrich hope you've enjoyed part one um, I want to get on to part two and basically la last episode we talked with Douglas about uh, Satanism in the military and he had lots to tell us so I, I imagine a lot of people just want to get on with it so that's what I'm going to do continue to please leave um, ideas on future shows and guests I've already had lots of help from um, listeners in sort of helping decide on guests and also actually helping contact guests and giving me ideas so thanks for that just a quick hello to some of those people Linda Lou uh, Linda Lou S I'm not going to give full names thank you Linda Kate Kate M shall we say Thank you. Ron Gibson, I just want to thank you for putting up um, Truth Sentinel um, programs on your channel. Same channel where um, Alex Jones gets his shows put up as well. I uh, also want to thank all guests who have already been on this show. Um, if you're still listening, thank you. I appreciate you coming on and uh, look forward to any new guests who might be listening and think you want to come on talk about something. Remember to drop us an email if you've got any questions or if you would like to come on as a guest or you'd like to suggest uh, any guests or topics. ScottSentinel9 at gmail.com That's ScottSentinel9 at gmail.com Also check out our Twitter and Facebook page. Uh, topics coming up in future episodes could include Super Soldiers which is probably going to be the next episode. Mysterious Celebrity Deaths um, Planned Obsolescence uh, the Dyatlov Pass incident, very creepy situation there. We're going to talk about that at some point. Religious cults. But without further ado, let's go to part two of my chat with Douglas Dietrich. So Douglas, you were talking about money and um, you know how broke we both are, but um, <laughs> wh how, how does money come into this situation? Because money is magical. Obviously, paper currency is something that I feel is necessary for any developed civilization or modern state. When Marco Polo visited Asia and ultimately visited the Middle Kingdom of China, he came back to Europe with tales of paper money that was representative of currency that was held in reserve meaning actual gold or silver or uh, actual minerals of value 
So everyone thought he was lying. They thought he was crazed, uh, making up stories that didn't make any sense. Of course, this has become the very foundation of Western civilization in this day and age, but it's based on the magic of belief. Uh, once uh, all of us uh, get to a certain point where we realize that the paper itself is worthless, and that it is not representative of actual stocks, actual, uh, shall we say, worthwhile solid goods that are somewhere to back it up, such as gold, such as silver, etc. Uh, once we realize that, then the money, of course, ceases to have any meaning, becomes the equivalent of toilet paper, everybody panics, and civilization collapses. Now, at so, some so point, literally, um, are you saying they're just printing money? Uh, just, just out of nothing. There's no gold to back it up or anything. Well, at this point in history, yes. It's not that there's no gold in existence, of course. Obviously, there's gold out there, but there's not enough gold in the world to back up what they are printing. And if there were enough gold in the world to back up what they were printing, gold would be absolutely worthless because it would be so common, it would no longer hold uh, value. And therefore, the currency wouldn't hold any value. So we're basically in a situation at this point that started in the uh, reign of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he assumed power in the exact same year as Adolf Hitler, 1933, Adolf Hitler had already based his uh, civilization on something that had been going on for several decades. Uh, people can look this up. The Reichsmark existed long before the Third Reich, and it was not the currency of the Imperial Reich of the Kaiser, who abdicated his throne in 1918-1919. During that year in which the Kaiser relocated himself to Switzerland and uh, later to other neutral countries that he would visit, uh, the uh, German economy went into total collapse, and uh, there were several types of currencies that were uh, produced at the rate of just printing out the dollars as fast as they could. Uh, this resulted in hyperinflation, but the Nazis ultimately took care of all of that. The National Socialist Party, which was a legal viable party that was ultimately democratically elected, was democratically elected by a landslide because it had ushered in its own currency. It did so in the year my mother was born, 1923. And at that period of time, what they did was they went to several major industrialists in Weimar, Germany, and they asked the industrialists to use their own reserves, their own, basically the gold they had in stock and silver and in some cases even diamonds, but their own valuables to back up this uh, basically counter currency, this, art, this uh, populist form of currency known as the Reichsmark, so they undercut the Weimar currency from the bottom up. They created an economy from the grassroots level up, and as a result, their economy proved itself stronger than the worthless paper money that was printed by the Weimar government, and they were ultimately voted in to replace it. Now, why this is never taught in any schools is beyond me. All anyone needs to do is look up on any search engine when the Reichsmark went out of circulation, and they will find that the Reichsmark was in circulation until 1947, 1948. Now, think about what I'm saying. In other words, the Reichsmark was so strong that to help the... Cause now, Michael Hemmingson wrote, he co-wrote a book with the heir of... The Temple of Set, the man who will take over after Aquino dies. Now, this guy's name is Don Webb. Now, Don Webb is an older guy, very nondescript. You'd never give him a second look on the street. That's his advantage in anonymity. He is the man who is deeply steeped in black ritual magic, and with a K. He is the man who will take over the Temple of Set when Aquino dies. He co wrote a book on the Satanic Church with Michael Hemmingson. Then Michael Hemmingson started uh, asking me about Aquino, says, hey, Aquino's coming on to Above Top Secret. He's saying, you're full of shit, that he never worked with you. And I said, dude, you're messing with the wrong people. This will cost you your life. You've got a daughter. You better pull out of this while you can. You're not going to come out of this alive. He says, oh, no. And Aquino says, you're lying. And, you know, I'm going to have Aquino confront you and because I'm best friends with Don Webb who's going to inherit the church, and then, of course, Aquino came out and publicly 
tried to sue me, and, of course, he couldn't get anywhere. Because everything I say is a matter of public record. And everything I say is verifiable. And so Aquino lost face. He was embarrassed. And he was really pissed. And then Michael Hemmingson died. And he, his body was found in Mexico. And no doubt he died here. And his body was carried across the border. Where the police just took one look at it and said, well, We're not going to put any money into investigating this shit. <laughs> and so there was no autopsy. No real coroner's job on finding out what killed him. And there you have it. One of our hosts at Revolution Radio bit the dust because he was messing with the wrong crowd. Now, that really ought to put things into perspective for everyone who listens to Scott Sentinel on the True Sentinel about how serious this game is. So if anyone thinks, oh, this Douglas Dietrich, yeah, man, he's an entertainer. Oh, yeah, man, he's just out for, you know, uh, spewing out all this shit. Okay, people are dying around me. People are going to jail for the rest of their lives around me. People are breaking out of their mental programming around me. And instead of killing innocent civilians, are turning around and killing authorities. Now, if people don't start taking me seriously, I don't know what it's going to take. So, in terms of what I'm saying, kids, adults, pay attention, grow up, smell the coffee, and come to terms with the fact that what I'm telling you is the truth, it's factual, it's what's going down, and in terms of the U.S. military, with this junta that took over, they were able to use these kids, these super soldiers, which they programmed into multiple personalities, they get them to sleep with and compromise politicians. As a matter of fact, if you're a politician who's not compromised by one of these kids, the chances are you're never going to win the seat or the position that you're seeking. And that's why probably honest Joes, like Vanderbeek, who's running for the governor of uh, Nevada, and uh, Martinez, who's running for the sheriff's position in Las Vegas, it's no wonder that they targeted the Millers on these guys, had them help with the campaign trail, and if they hadn't broken out of their programming uh, with exposure to the fact that the uh, mind control summit was going down, they probably would have killed those two dudes. I have no doubt about it. And instead, they turned the hostility elsewhere and ultimately off themselves. That, my friends, is heroism. So in terms of... Uh, What's going down, just remember how you see the world and how the government programs you to see it is totally different from the reality that really is, especially if you're an American and you've got no concept of what's going on. But um, in terms of uh, what we were saying about the uh, military junta and occultism, so these kids, they sleep with politicians and they're trained to reconnoiter all their property. They get to learn the ins and outs of their estates of their New York City apartments. And if they're ever given the order, they kill the politician and themselves, make it look like a lover's suicide between a politician and his young, underage, gay male lover. And the politician's family is ruined from uh, participating in politics for generations. So with that hanging over them, that's why less than 1% of the population every year gets voted over 50% of the nation's annual discretionary budget, whereas everything else withers on the vine, including veterans' benefits. And uh, with this kind of dictatorship going on, what does this military junta do? Well, it investigates things like uh, maximizing the human potential, if you will, with characters like the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer was famous for wearing camouflage and wearing combat boots, the footprints he would leave, were combat boot footprints. Everyone would say, oh, that was like, uh, you know, he got them out of a surplus store uh, and all this other good shit. Nothing could be further from the truth. This guy was operating on a military agenda. Great example of this would be uh, Sergeant Stebbins of the U.S. Army Rangers. Sergeant uh, Stebbins was uh, made a hero in the movie Black Hawk Down. They changed his name to Danny Grimes. So if you ever watch the movie Black Hawk Down in Somalia, you'll see the uh, character, the lead character, Danny Grimes, is portrayed as this great hero, but in reality, he's a child rapist. 
And the character on which he's based is Sergeant Stebbins, who was ultimately turned in by his wife and is spending the rest of his life in Leavenworth Military Penitentiary. Now, all of his crimes were committed that we know of after his retirement. So what's he doing in a military penitentiary? Why isn't he in a regular jail with all the other baby raping sons of bitches? Because he was committing rapes of young boys under military authority. He had to be under military control or he would not be placed in a military prison. This way they keep civilians from ever investigating him. They keep civilian journalists from interviewing him. They keep the story secret. Take another look at this other uh, U.S. Army Green Berets, Special Forces, which Colonel Aquino was a part of. He was U.S. Army Special Forces Green Berets. There was another bloke I met at the Presidio named uh, Master Sergeant Michael Ramirez. He had a shoebox full of memories. All these women who he raped with his bayonet, vaginally and anally, and anally. he cut off their nipples with his bayonet before he cut off their heads and had oral sex with their decapitated heads. He took Polaroids of all of this, had several shoeboxes full of these memories. He'd bring them to the library and share them with other veterans and the library staff, the men who all thought it was cool and thought it was funny as hell. I had to keep him out of the children's room. Now, this mofo, he basically was going to Letterman Army Medical Center for his methadone treatments. And I asked him, you know, how did you get busted? Because he was sentenced to his methadone treatments. And I said, how did you get busted? Most of you guys get away with all this crap. He says, oh, well, I blew my wife's head off in front of the wrong witness. I said, who was that? He said, oh, my nephew. And I said, he ever, your nephew ever take a look at this shit? He says, yeah, he used to take these photographs. He'd take them to the cemetery and lean against his tombstone and whack off over them in the moonlight. I said, well, who was your nephew? Well, it turned out his nephew was Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. <laughs> so, I heard about that guy. He was pretty, pretty evil. Uh... A Satanist, a practicing Satanist. And uh, so you're talking about this is your super soldier program. These are the maximization of human potential that they're talking about. This is what your government is producing. So think about that when you think of all these kids that I'm talking about and when you think of victims like Jared Miller and his wife Amanda. So they're heroes because they didn't turn into these monsters. So we really have got to realize this is ongoing. This is a part and parcel of how your military junta, because ever since General Rutherford B. Hayes of the Union Army took over the United States in a military junta, this military junta has been running the United States ever since. We have not had a single elected president since that time. It's always been a president select. And when the president select begins to not play the game like John F. Kennedy, they take him out. Uh, one of the presidents who didn't want to play the game was Harry Truman. And they tried to take him out. As a matter of fact, Harry Truman uh, was on his way home to uh, the estate that he was living in while the White House was under reconstruction. And on his way home, his car broke down. And if he hadn't been 30 minutes late towards getting home, he would have been killed by a hit squad of men who came in and killed a cop and a security guard who were guarding the estate that he was living in temporarily. Now, since he was living in an estate that was top-level secret, only the military knew about it because he was executive commander-in-chief, the only conclusion we can draw is that it was a military hit squad that came in, just plugged the whole area with bullets, uh, and turned it into Swiss cheese. Both the guys wound up with their shadows looking like the Eiffel Tower, and the 33rd president of the United States would have been in the midst of that palisade had his car not broken down on the way home. That's how close Truman came to buying it. And uh, so that's the kind of world that Americans live in, and they have no concept of what they're living in. Of course, this stood out like a sore thumb, so the United States population said, what was this hit team that tried to kill our president? And the military said, that was a Puerto Rican uh, team of rebels uh, because they want us to stop occupying the United States. Uh, I mean, uh, the island of Puerto Rico as our 51st state. Well, anyone who checks up on this will realize that Puerto Rico is not a 51st state of the United States, that it's never been a state of the United States, <laughs> that there is no Puerto Rican resistance movement because Puerto Rico is not a part of the United States. So, obviously, this is how ignorant Americans are, and they're, they're, their U.S. government says that to them, they just suck it up because, like I said, if Americans finally have to realize what I'm saying is true, they have to come to grips with, you know, I'm paying taxes 
for a holocaust of 7 million people dying from radiation cancer because of all of our above ground nuclear tests and Project Argus and all this other crap. You know, I'm paying to support this and I've either got to stop paying or take up a gun against this government. So, I mean, a great example of this is Stanton Friedman, who is, of course, the MC, Master Ceremonies, for the Roswell Parade every year on the anniversary of Roswell, which they've coincided with the 4th of July. They make Roswell as American as apple pie and firecrackers. Stanton Friedman was a government-contracted nuclear physicist. Now, Stanton Friedman will come on to your program, or anyone's, and he'll say, I've never worked for the government. And yet, if you look up his record, you see he worked with nuclear flight. So if you say, hey, Stan, you ever work with nuclear flight? He'll say, yes. And yet, there's no one who's ever funded any research into nuclear flight other than the U.S. government. <laughs> so that you've got this government-contracted physicist, and he was involved with the Convair MBH-36 program. Now, the Convair MBH-36 program was when they took a broken-up Convair MBH-36, which is a propeller-driven bomber. It's a bomber that's uh, run on propellers, run on just regular fuel, prop-driven. It's not a jet plane. And so they've got this bomber that got tore up in a storm, and they put a lead wall behind the pilot's cockpit, the pilot's cockpit, and they put on a leaky nuclear reactor when they reassembled it. And so they put a leaky nuclear reactor in flight. It was called the Crusader. Convair NBH-36 Crusader program. Now, this was so dangerous to its pilots that it sterilized any man who flew it. So none of the pilots would fly it. They threatened suicide if they were given orders to fly it. So they brought pilots out of retirement from World War II and World War I. And they said, well, this way you won't be sterilized because you're past reproduction age. So all their pilots... For the Convair Crusader, we're 86 years old or above. <laughs> so they had nothing to lose. Yeah, you're an 87 to 90 year old pilots flying this plane. And uh, the acronym for the program was SLAM, which stood for slow, low, and messy. And literally, I kid you not, they would fly over farms in America and they would microwave chickens in their coops. And they so radiated all the United States that Stanton Friedman moved out of the United States and became a Canadian citizen. <laughs> so he lives in Canada. He won't even come down to the United States because he's afraid if he stays down here too long, his balls will glow in the dark. <laughs> now that, so this, this mofo comes down here and tells everybody, hey, Roswell was aliens. Don't tell anybody. Government doesn't want you to know. He's been saying this for how long? 50 years, half a century? No one blows him away. He's got a special needs daughter. Or granddaughter, I forget which, or goddaughter. But he's got a special needs relative who's part of the Canadian welfare system. That's how he maintains her. And, of course, he basically, she never dies. No one kills her. For him going around and reporting to you what you're not supposed to know. He goes around and says, hey, it was aliens. Now, if it was really aliens and they wouldn't want you to know, his daughter would be dead. Or granddaughter, or goddaughter, or whoever she is. But no, he gets all kinds of money. He emcees this parade at Roswell. So it's all part of this bullshit, you know, fantasy that the Americans live in because the Americans are crazed. They're crazed anti-culture of pathological dimensions that would rather see fantasy as opposed to the reality that they're living in, which is hell on earth. That they live in a, under a military junta run by Satanists and that they are basically paying taxes to support it and uh, that... Um, and, and that's it. I think that, that would be the best wrap-up for this, for this interview. Uh, but but I'll, you're welcome to, of course, ask some questions to round it out. But I think you'd agree with me that for this interview, at least, I think, what more can I say to really <laughs> kind of put a perspective? Absolutely. You've covered so much today, which um, I think is going to give people a lot of things to think about. And, uh, you know, I think uh, people can go on the Internet. We're lucky to have this tool these days so we can go and check on a lot of things that you've been saying. So... You've said so much stuff. I wanted to ask you one last question, and, and, and you may not know much about this, but you seem to know a lot about a lot of things, so I wanted to ask you anyway, just in case. Um, do you happen to know anything about MH370, the missing Malaysian plane, or do you, do you have any theories as to what that could all be about? 
You know, I thank you for bringing that up because that, that brings up another case of name dropping, which is inescapable. Uh, basically, uh, we have a situation, and, and by the way, before I go into that, uh, another little bit of name dropping here, if it'll come up on my uh, computer at all. Uh, I'm trying to access this right now, and it's uh, not coming up. It was the name of, uh, the, anyhow, it, it might come up in due time. I'll just give it some time. But in terms of what you are mentioning, the I, I know absolutely uh, it, nothing uh, other than what many people have probably explored by now, which is the fact that you had a situation where there was a Texas company that was working in alternative energy, and it had contracted a number of Chinese engineers. Was that and, um, Freescale, I think it was called? Yes, it? it was. It was. Thank you. I couldn't have gotten that out without you. And the Chinese engineers uh, were all put on this plane. They all owned stock in the company. And the contract was written in such a way that if they all died or if something happened to them, that uh, basically the company would wind up owning all of the shares. It would all turn over to the company. Well, of course, they all died at once, and all of the shares turned over to that company. <laughs> and uh, that alone would seem sufficient reason enough to take the plane out with all of them on it. Now, what had also happened was uh, there was a young Australian en engineer. He was actually a New Zealander who had moved to Australia. Now, New Zealand's economy just sucks. Uh, there's apparently nothing uh, to do in New Zealand in terms of finding people employment. So a lot of New Zealanders get a very high quality education uh, that you get in New Zealand or Australia or many of these Commonwealth nations and they have nothing to do with their education. They, there's basically no place to be employed so they have to leave. And so he had left from New Zealand to Australia. Now, the, he almost certainly took this plane out of the sky. Uh, what he had done was he uh, turned towards his wife. He had bought off a full insurance policy, full policy of life insurance. And uh, he was so effed up in Australia because economies, the economy in Australia sucks too. Uh, it's barely above New Zealand's. There's nothing for anybody to do. And so you get this high quality education and uh, he couldn't find employment in Australia. He had married an Australian lady. He had gotten Australian citizenship by doing that. Uh, he had two kids. He uh, couldn't afford to raise them. So the end result was he basically uh, turned towards his wife after buying this enormous insurance policy, handed her a gold watch that he was wearing, some heirloom watch, uh, a number of other heirloom items, and told her, I'm not coming back. And uh, he was flying that plane as a connection flight to outer Mongolia. He was going to spend the next several years, maybe a decade, in outer Mongolia earning money to send home to his wife. That's how bad the employment is down in the South Pacific. He had to go to Central Asia in the Gobi Desert to work as an engineer so he could start sending stuff home to his wife. Obviously, he thought that that was a death sentence. He wasn't going to go through it. So he turned to his wife, gave her the insurance, told her he wasn't coming back. Now, all of this is vetable. This is I, have, I have heard about this guy, yeah. Yeah, and I forget his name, but people can look it up, along with the names of the Chinese engineers, which I understand are very hard to find now. Uh, but this was all uh, originally that he got on the plane. He was the hitman for Freescale. And so Freescale no doubt paid him and told him his family would be supported the rest of their lives if he took out this plane with all the Chinese engineers on it. Now, that makes perfect sense to me. Now, here you've got the situation. And here's where some more name dropping comes in. You've got the situation where Richard Dolan uh, comes in. And this is the joke. To explain some of the background for you, uh, we were at what was known as UFOCon uh, 2011. I believe it was UFOCon 2011. And at UFOCon 2011, a UFO conference, obviously, in San Francisco, uh, that was produced by my manager, us, Lorian Ann Fenton, uh, along with Brian William Hall, who usually uh, produces the Conspiracy Con. Now, uh, one of the presenters was myself, and another presenter was uh, Richard Dolan. Now, we were on a speaker's panel, and prior to that, Richard Dolan and I had ate dinner together at the banquet. So I sat next to him and his wife at that time, Karen Dolan. They are now since divorced. Uh, he was uh, basically 
uh, talking to me about Rochester, New York, and I told him, well, well, my father was born at Rochester, New York, and I told him all about Rochester, New York, and he'd lived there for what must be 20 years by now, or close to it. He didn't know anything about Rochester, New York. He didn't know anything about the Kodak Company or anything about it. Now, that was very puzzling to me, and uh, it basically, he seemed to be very much involved with the young blonde lady that he's hanging around with these days uh, after divorcing his wife. He's much more public about hanging around with her, but she was at the conference, and people were photographing this. So that's a matter of public record. He even put it up on his Facebook timeline, his pictures making out with her, then he took them down. All that is basically nothing. That has nothing to do with anything other than the fact that he's bought and he's paid. He is obviously involved with someone who's a government handler. Now, he was prepared for questions that all these white males in the audience came up and asked during the panel that were directed against me. They said, Mr. Dolan, what do you think about this Douglas Dietrich guy? Now, by the way, nobody ever asked anything like that during a conference panel. Uh, and anybody who is sane uh, as the person who is monitoring the panel, in this case, it was Sean David Martin, and he behaved very well. He behaved very professionally. Nobody would allow it to go on because it's obviously a personal attack. But beyond that, the person who's asked that question, when you're on a professional panel with other professional speakers, first thing you tell people is that is something, I have my own opinions, they may differ from this individual, uh, but uh, more or less they're not going to speak to anything personally about that individual, nor are they going to start a debate on the panel. There's just no point, uh, because it's not a forum for debate. You're answering questions. But, oh no, not Richard Dolan. He said, saying, Douglas Dietrich, Oh, he has no basis in history. Everything he says is a lie and a fantasy. He's psychotic. Anyhow, so uh, I rejoined her to him and uh, lashed out my contrapuntal, and I left him barking like a dog. He was just going, whoa, 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 literally, whoa, 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 and then this was all recorded. So it's all on DVD, which anyone can order, and I don't make a dime off of this. This is all Brian William Hall, uh, who I barely speak to these days. He's the one who organized the conference along with my producer and manager. He gets the money as part of their contractual deal for all the DVDs sold from this conference. But if you order the speaker's panel of the 2011 or 2010, 2012, look up which one I'm presenting at with Richard Dolan. I think it's 2011. Uh, but uh, if you look that up uh, and order the DVD, you can watch for your own eyes my basically eviscerating and emasculating Richard Dolan on stage and leaving him barking like a dog while he's trying to attack me. He started this, like, personal attack. And uh, and you see these men asking him questions that are directed against me. You'll see another guy get up and ask a question, could it be that they send some young Asian guy with charisma to mislead us all? And that's when, of course, Sean David Morton says, yeah, that'd be me. And anyhow, so th this was the kind of the farce that went on with Richard Dolan. Now, Richard Dolan is one of these people who got on YouTube and he put up this video about the Asian politics behind the disappearance of Malaysian Flight 370. And it's got like 20,000 hits. I'm like, why is anyone looking at this shit? The guy, unlike myself, I was born in Taiwan. I could speak to the politics behind the disappearance of Malaysian Flight 370. And of course, I'm very familiar with military history aeronautical disappearances, even if I'm not following it religiously, I can give you a baseline background that makes sense. Now, this guy, on the other hand, Richard Dolan has a degree in history, but he's never taught. He's not a professor. He's as uh, discredited in his universities as I would be in the military as a Marine because of my dishonorable discharge in the Marine Corps, which is a whole different story, and I've always been very public about that. And it's because of an incident in Algebra. I've gone into that on my records, on my Facebook timeline. People are willing to invest, who, who want to investigate this are welcome to do so. Now, in terms of Richard Dolan, it's like he had a dishonorable discharge with academia. He's not teaching in there. He's just writing these books on UFOs. And yet, here's this guy who's a history teacher writing about UFOs. And yet, he gets into this conference, and people can look this up, where he's speaking on the engineering aspects of the collapse of the Twin Towers. Now, how the hell does a history teacher address the engineering aspects of the collapse of the Twin Towers? Then he winds up making this video on the politics, the Asian politics behind the disappearance of flight, uh, Malaysian Flight 370. Now, what is he doing speaking to these topics? He's not even qualified to speak about any of this. Bottom line is the government pushes him in 
and people just accept him because he's Richard Dolan. He gets up there and he pushes the government line, and everybody goes and they eat it. They eat it up uh, like fools because this guy is familiar to them, and he's a guy who's been pumped and pushed. So uh, people have really got to look at who's pumping, who's pushing, because Richard Dolan is part of the Roswell is Aliens crowd with Stanton Friedman, who radiated your children's children and made your sperm glow in the dark. So you take a look at all these guys operating together, try and look at what you're doing. You know, another guy who's involved with all that is, of course, uh, you know, the um, Bill Burns, William Burns, who is on the UFO Hunters series and he publishes UFO magazine. Now William Burns and his wife organized their own radio program called Future Theater. They were going to interview me on Future Theater. So the week before they interviewed me, they interviewed the granddaughter of Betty and Barney Hill who had written her own book. Now all you need to do is go to Future Theater as hosted by Bill and Nancy Burns and look up their interview with the granddaughter of Betty and Barney Hill. Now, during that interview, they said, we're having Douglas Dietrich on with us next week. He's a Jap. See, it's Japs we're at. Roswell. <laughs> and I, I, that's when I called him up. Actually, I waited until the last minute, and I canceled my interview. <laughs> and she had to send me a po an apology. She wrote me an apology, which I published on my Facebook timeline. It's in the notes. People can look it up on the notes of my Facebook timeline. But she had to send me an apology, but I never had an interview with her. It was obviously an ambush so that they were setting up. Now, these are the people who wrote The Day After Roswell. Now, Bill Burns co-authored The Day After Roswell with Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso. Now, what did Philip J. Corso do? Philip J. Corso uh, basically was a contactee in the 1950s sense. He worked at the Pentagon, and he was in the U.S. Army National Guard. He had high-level security clearances. And he came out and he told Bill Burns, I've met with the aliens and they've offered us peace. They said we could have a whole new world if you're ready for it. Now, the person who's relayed this publicly is Linda Moulton Howe. So this was what he was pushing. And uh, Bill Burns says, that's 1950s shit. Nobody wants to hear that. They want Roswell. So we're going to tell them, you were at Roswell. You saw all this stuff. And it was released to the public slowly and advanced our technology, gave us pacemakers and stuff. What do you say? We write this. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, I want to write this other book about, you know, the aliens, what they're trying to tell us. And Bill Burns says, no, let's do this first. This will get your name established. Trust me on this. So they went to uh, make sure the book would sell. They approached Senator Strom Thurmond. So Senator Strom Thurmond, they says, hey, you know, uh, Colonel Philip Corso here, he used to work with Eisenhower. And uh, we wrote this book called I Walk With Giants in which we're talking about his doing all his scut work and errand boy work for Eisenhower and the big names in the Supreme Allied Command of Europe. Uh, how'd you like to write an introduction to that book? And Strom Thurmond said, I would be honored, gentlemen. So he writes this introduction to the book I Walked with Giants, which it turns out didn't exist. <laughs> and they put the introduction onto the day after Roswell. <laughs> and then Senator Strom Thurmond said, you mofos, I'm suing you. And so he said, you better recall all of those books. They'd already unleashed 25, because this book had to be out before the 50th anniversary of Roswell in 1997. So it was coming out for the 4th of July in 1997. So it was released just days before the 50th anniversary, the half century mark of the Roswell incident in 1997. And Strom Thurmond presented them with the impossible. He says, I'm going to sue your asses into, you know, until you're both, you know, living in poor houses. You don't recall all of those books and get my introduction to my name out of that book the day after Roswell. And they were able to do it. They recalled 20,000 books within a week and were able to reissue them in time for the 4th of July anniversary, 50th half century mark of Roswell within a week. Now, how can you recall over 20,000 books, maybe more than that, 24, 25,000 books, incinerate them under, uh, under uh, pressure of a lawsuit? And then reissue them again. Wait, wait, it had to be federal. This is federal. So the whole Roswell myth that all the Americans adore, this holy grail of their ufology, is all government sponsored and all the men behind it. By the way, after that, Philip J. Corso said, after all that stress, he says to Bill Burns, well, let's write my other book on it. And then Bill Burns didn't want to do it. So uh, Philip Corso felt very betrayed. He died alone in acrimony and in great bitterness, 
and uh, felt he had been terribly exploited and used. And uh, basically, uh, he's a tragic victim. So you've got this uh, person who wasn't even a government cooperator in this propagation of a myth. He's a victim who was on a totally different trip, uh, got used and exploited, uh, and, and died pretty much unrecognized for anything he was trying to say. Uh, the only person that mentioned what he was really trying to get at was Linda Moulton Howe. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, Bill Burns and uh, the uh, Richard Dolan and, uh, of course, uh, Stanton Friedman, these are all part of that Roswell mafia that is obviously government. I mean, it's so obvious that the Americans who continue to follow them, I mean, they, 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 can't, they can't even have an excuse anymore. At, at this point, it's, it's literally pathological that they, the American public, it's very similar to child abuse. It's the cycle of abuse, where the abused child winds up reconnoitering and recruiting victims for the abuse of parent. This happens all the time, where children who are repeatedly raped by their father or, and, or family, they grow up saying, I don't want any more of this rape. Well, the way they avoid it is they bring in other victims for their family to rape. This is what your American body politic is like. They've been so raped by the government that they now come to adore, hear a warship, and they are enslaved to their government. They are psychophanic. So when the government says it was Roswell, it was aliens, then they, they feed into that and they try to force that on others. They actually propagate it like a religion and they promote it as such. This is the sickening cycle of violence, just like children who grow up to be wife beaters or child rapers themselves. And they do this to their kids. Kids are raised with their parents taking them to Roswell as a religious Mecca. That is the closest that Americans have to Lourdes or Medjugorje. And it was all a psyop from Colonel Aquino. He was recalled from Vietnam to do this in 1968, or 1969, excuse me. He deployed to Vietnam with psyops in 1968. He was recalled in 1969 when Sergeant Melvin Brown who was at, was at the Roswell incident, started to talk. Because men landed on the moon. And Sergeant Melvin Brown turned around to his kids and said, you know, after uh, they told us World War II was over, it wasn't. And we had this incident, and I dealt with the bodies at Roswell, and they were illegal enemy aliens. And I looked under the tarp, they told me not to look, but they were yellow. That's his exact words, they were yellow. And they were burnt orange, and they were turning gray with rigor mortis. And all his kids could think of was Indian, black, the man on the moon. And it all went downhill from there. And uh, Aquino exploited that because it was an army issue. There had been no Air Force at the time of the Roswell incident in 1947. There was no such thing as an Air Force. It was still a United States Army Air Corps. The 509th Atomic Bomber Wing was part of that. So this was an army issue. And he was recalled from Vietnam. They said, look, you're an expert in psyops. Uh, we've got this guy who was ex-army who started to talk. The public's going to find out about this. What are you going to do? Oh, don't worry. I'll work with idiots. I'll compromise a bunch of fools. He compromised Stanton Friedman. Uh, said, look, you're a government contracted physicist. Uh, you're going to go over there at Roswell. You're going to start this whole Roswell myth about it being aliens as opposed to Asian prisoners of war. You're going to tell them all about this. Make them a deal because we're taking away the Roswell Army Air Force Base. Now Roswell Air Force Base, we're going to take that airfield, we're going to move it to Texas under LBJ because he's a Texan. We're going to take the entire economy away from Roswell. They're going to wither up and blow away in the sand. You tell them we're going to take it away and the only thing they're going to do to keep their economy going or either they're going to have to leave, the only thing they're going to do to keep their economy going and stay is to say it was aliens. So Stanton Friedman went over there, made a deal with all the elders of Roswell. Now, every time one of those mofos in the elder community at Roswell would die, everyone would get around and gather around like vultures and have them sign affidavit saying it was aliens. And you know what? Aquino equated that litigiously with whatever him and Stanton Friedman set up as a deal with the devil. He had a little pegboard, and every time one of those guys died, he'd say, another soul to Satan, he'd move another peg up on the board. He was counting every time one of those uh, older people died, and he said, you know what, Douglas? My greatest satanic triumph in PSYOPs is getting all the American people to worship a little gray alien without genitals as their connection between the divinity and the heavens and themselves. I got them looking at this as their Jesus Christ. And that was his greatest laugh of all.
was getting this supposedly Christian nation to literally think that little gray man from outer space had delivered them all the technology which made them a great nation. That is how crazy Americans are. And it all is satanic. Now guess what? He's working as a columnist at Above Top Secret. He says him and Lieutenant Colonel, uh, or excuse me, Colonel John Alexander, retired, that they were space agents, secret space agents for a secret space program. And now he's funding the secret space program conference, which is going to take place here in California. And who's speaking there? Richard Dolan. And who's the MC? And Henrik Palmgren of Red Ice Radio. Now, Henrik Palmgren of Red Ice Radio interviewed me about Satanism in the military. And he put that two hours up on his Red Ice Creations Radio website. Got a, a whole bunch of hits. One of his most popular shows. And then Colonel Aquino came and told him to shut it down. Now, he went on air and said this. Henrik Palmgren went on air and said, Colonel Michael Aquino has told me to take down one of my episodes in which I interviewed someone who I will not name about Colonel Michael Aquino and Satanism in the military. I won't give you the name of that episode, so you can't look it up. But I'm not going to take it down, because I'm not going to bow to a Satanist. But I won't tell you who it is, so you can't listen to me. <laughs> and then, now he's the MC at the Secret Space Program with Richard Dolan Conference, and it's a joke. All the people there, including Joseph Farrell, are compromised. Everybody there is compromised. This is all part of... Now, keep in mind that Colonel Michael Aquino, anyone can look this up, with PSYOPs. That has nothing to do with space. And the Army had nothing to do with space. There was an Air Force space program, which was covert, far less advanced than people are giving it credit for, but that was Air Force. It was not Army. There's no Army intelligence secret space program. He's conducting a PSYOPs, through Mark Springer's Above Top Secret, and now he's got the secret space program he's funding here in California, and Henrik Palmgren of Red Eyes Creations Radio is emceeing it, Richard Dolan speaking there, Joseph Farrell speaking there. Now, if this picture isn't becoming clear, if it isn't gelling for people, I don't know what does. So, thank you, Scott Sentinel. I do want to mention, I guess, something about uh, before we uh, go off air. Uh, exactly uh, one of the things that I want to uh, bring up concerning uh, our DVDs and uh, what I'm going to be doing in the very near future in the next few minutes. Is that okay with you? Of course it is, yeah. What will you be doing? Well, um, at least through uh, the, um, I think it, it, it will be in October, or it will be either September or October, we're going to be taking a tour which, where I'll be speaking at different cities where anyone wants me to speak We've got uh, at least two or three people who are supporting us in the American Southwest, in the state of Arizona is specifically. So I will be doing a speaking tour at Tucson and Phoenix, I believe, or some other places in Arizona. And uh, therefore, anyone who wants to help fund or organize uh, a speech or a presentation, uh, my presence as a guest speaker, my personal appearance as a guest speaker, Go ahead and contact my mistress and manager, Lorian Ann Fenton, at the address or the electronic address of Lorian at DouglasDietrich.com. Now, her name is spelled just like the car, the DeLorean, L-O-R-I-E-N, -E excuse me, L-O-R-I-E-N, at DouglasDietrich.com. Douglas is spelled with one S. Dietrich is spelled just like the famous actress, Marlena Dietrich. And uh, um, uh, just put the words diet and rich together. So Lorian at DouglasDietRich.com. And you can write her and tell her what you would like to help organize, uh, if that's at all possible for you. Now, in terms of uh, what else that we're doing, at least through the summer, we're still selling the DVDs of my two presentations, Roswell and the Rising Sun and Satan's Crusaders, for $25. If you don't own them already, this summer should truly be the last chance to pick them up. Now, their contents are, of course, uh, Satanism in the military, like I spoke of with Red Eyes Creations Radio, uh, except uh, with images that you're not going to see anywhere else. I was educated in forensic photography at City College of San Francisco by the same instructors 
who taught Magus Anton Zandor LaVey, the black pope of the First Church of Satan, forensic photography. Now, Anton uh, Zandor LaVey organized the Church of Satan, which Michael Aquino converted to before a schism occurred and Michael, Convino, uh, Michael Aquino established the Temple of Set. And uh, what happened with uh, Anton LaVey was he majored in forensic photography at San Francisco City College so he could become a criminal photographer for the San Francisco Police Department and thereby evade the Korean War era draft. Now, he also became their expert on occult crime, if you can believe it. But uh, those same teachers who taught him just before they retired taught me forensic photography, and that's how I was able to take spy photographs with little German Vice spy cameras like you used to see in the old James Bond films. Looks like a cigarette case. You split it in half, the little lens appears. You're using film that was actually kept in refrigerators. You used to buy them by the dozens or any amount you wanted in great jars that were at photography shops. All this technology is gone now, but it was black and white photos because forensic photography used to be black and white. But I took photos of men and animals that were sacrificed to demons at the Presidio military base. You're not going to see these images anywhere else there in uh, the uh, Satan's Crusaders DVD. You get that with Roswell and the Rising Sun for a quarter of $100. $5 goes to shipping and handling and $10 for each DVD. So it's a great price. Now, recently I appeared on the special guest panel at the Mind Control Summit 3 in Las Vegas. And last year I was a featured guest speaker. You can purchase the on-demand video of the second summit, which includes my presentation and private investigator Ed Oppermans, who's now working with these guys who were working with Jared and Amanda Miller, the revolution and suicide cop killing shooters in Las Vegas. You can purchase uh, all 13 hours of myself and these other presenters by um, going online to download these presentations. The regular price price, <laughs> forgive me, I've been talking a long time, I'm totally dry. <laughs> the regular price for this on-demand video is 30 bucks, but I'm going to give your listeners at uh, True Sentinel a discount code so they can watch it for 20 bucks. All they have to do is visit www.mindcontrolsummit.com. So at mindcontrolsummit.com, you click on the Summit to On Demand tab, and when prompted during the checkout, enter this code. John 23. That's John with a capital J and the numerals 2 and 3. So G, capital J, O, H, N in lowercase, John 2, 3. And uh, that will get you uh, the viewing of all those materials for uh, just uh, 20 bucks. Now, if all this has zinged past you, you can find it all listed on my website, www.douglasdietrich.com. Uh, once again, that's Douglas with one S, Dietrich, uh, just put the words diet and rich together, douglasdietrich.com, and you'll be there. So I, I very much want to thank Scott Sentinel for providing this venue. Uh, he's got a great format where he's very flexible. Hopefully all of this, or at least the overwhelming majority of this, will uh, make it from pre-courting to, uh, to the audio, because I do believe all this needs to be digitally archived, because you never know. You never know what might happen to me. Even if the government doesn't do anything against me, I could get hit by a truck just by sheer accident tomorrow. <laughs> Let's hope not anyway, uh, Douglas. But no, I wanted to thank you for coming on and giving us all this information. There's so much that we can, um, we can look at there and uh, do, do our own research as well. Um, I, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. It's been a, a pleasure listening to what you've had to say. I, I thank you for that, and thank you for the venue you provide and the responsibilities you've taken on yourself uh, in the investigation of these matters. Uh, next, I, I do hope there's, there's a next time, and hopefully sometime after you speak to my manager in the future, uh, you'll speak to me again and we can talk more about whistleblowers and why so many of them have effed up so bad and wound up where they've wound up, as opposed to at least maintaining a steady survival. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I hope you will come on again. I'm, go I'm going to go off now and see if I can uh, sort out the cooker and the jacuzzi in this apartment. Um, try and get the jacuzzi working so I can uh, have a relax a bit. But um, Well, don't scare me to death like that, because the last thing I want you to do is get electrocuted in the jacuzzi, and there's no <laughs> and none of this gets off. 
<laughs> You're right. I think I might go and sit out on the balcony instead, actually. Forget the jacuzzi. Yeah, that's a good idea for it until at least this gets uploaded. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. No, thanks so much, Douglas. Um, take you take it easy. Have a good. Uh, actually, you, it's night time over there, so I guess you're gonna you're gonna be heading off to sleep soon, anyway. Yes, yes, that's right. And Mr. Sentinel, you're the best. By the way, these are these are my waking hours, so don't even give it a thought. Uh, the I'll I'll head off towards sleep soon. Yes, but uh, definitely, I was awake. Uh, and uh, my best wishes for the time that Scott Sentinel invested in uh, helping this happen. Uh, and uh, believe me, uh, uh, I'll I'll try and send you a thank you on email, even if I get around to not doing that for a while. At least you know uh, verbally right now. I want it on record. Uh, you're one of the best. Thanks, thanks, Douglas. Really nice of you to say. Thanks. Cool. And le yeah, let's just definitely talk again soon. And um, and I'll look forward to speaking to Laurie N soon as well. Really. You take care, my friend. Yeah. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. So thanks again to Douglas for that. Hopefully, he'll come back on in the future and uh, come and talk to us again. Uh, also, Laurie N Fenton will be coming on um, probably next episode to talk about super soldiers and mind control. This is the section where we normally talk about economic markets, sports, space, weather or natural events. Just on the subject of sport very quickly, I'm not going to talk too much about other topics at the moment. Sports news, Luis Suarez bites Italian Giorgio Cellini at the uh, World Cup. Does, does this prove that there is something in the conspiracy, that there's a zombie virus causing people to desire human flesh? It remains to be seen, but he has bitten three people now, so the evidence is mounting. Um, remember, blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth, as said by Albert Einstein. Thinking of making Truth Sentinel t-shirts with that slogan on the back, and maybe some other slogans as well, so that people could wear them and uh, show people around them that they, um, they do distrust their governments, um, and maybe that's one way we could sort of display um, what we think and other people could um, maybe ask questions and then you know who knows what could happen let me know what you think about the t-shirts idea since this channel is about truth I'll be honest with you I'm, I'm not looking to make millions but it would be it would be good to be able to make enough to quit the day job and run this channel um, maybe employ some staff as well so let me know if you think that would be a good way of doing it um, we're about spreading tolerance, looking for peaceful yet revolutionary change on this channel to make a better society. We don't think it's happening with our current system of government, so we believe that it needs to be changed. Okay, look, thanks for listening. Always looking for sponsors, advertisers, finances. Please contact us at scottsentinel9 at gmail.com. Hope everyone has a fantastic week. Try to subscribe or um, save the playlist channel so you can listen to all future episodes. Thanks very much then. Goodbye.